Le live. J'ouvre. Ok. Allez, trois secondes, c'est ouvert. Go. Can we go with the video? Bonjour, bonsoir. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Ernesto Tone, UNESCO Assistant Director General for Culture of UNESCO. It is my great pleasure to welcome viewers to, to this online debate organized in partnership with the International Federation of Coalition for Cultural Diversity and the International Confederation of Societies of Author, Authors and Composers. This is the second uh, Resilia debate organized by UNESCO headquarters to discuss the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the creative sector. The first debate, which took place on April 15, discussed the impact of the crisis on the livelihoods of artists. Since the launch of the Resilia movement, 25 Resilia debates have been organized around the world by UNESCO field offices, national commission and experts. 30 more are scheduled in the next few weeks. Each Resilia debate is a unique opportunity to raise important issues and shine a light on the enormous global ramification of the current crisis on the creative sector. As many countries are, are now considering on implementing gradual lockdown exit strategies, today's debate will focus on the recovery of the cultural and creative sectors after the pandemic. It brings together seven renowned cultural professionals and artists from around the world. Anita Fandoni, Pascal Rogar, Fuzia Said, Mohamed Saif Al-Kaham, Sheikh Umar Sissoko, and Yana Vozarova. Um, I will moderate the discussion and ask our panelists two rounds of questions. At the end of the debate, there will be a 20 minutes of question and answer from you, from the audience. If you would like to ask questions to our panelists, please use the chat function. Our technical moderators will select questions and share them with me. 
A uh, quick message, message to our panelists. Please keep your cameras turned on and don't forget to check your micro uh, when you have to speak. So it is turned on. I would like to add that, like many people around the world, UNESCO has now engaged in the organization of many, many events online. Our, our organization supports multilingualism and usually tries to provide interpretation in uh, the working language of the United Nations. Today, we will use live captioning and automatic translation tools. These tools are not perfect, so please be patient if there are any technical glitches. Please also note that due to some limits of Microsoft Teams, only one speaker will be visible to the audience at each time. Before introducing our distinguished panelists, I would like to start by offering some additional context for this new Resilia debate and for new uh, viewers also. Resiliat is a global movement that was launched by UNESCO in partnership with CISAC uh, one month ago. And the movement has three goals. First, to raise awareness about the impact of COVID-19 on the car sector and the livelihoods of artists and cultural professionals. Second, to give visibility to artists and cultural professionals worldwide to ensure their voice are heard at policy level to address existing, existing gaps and needs. And third, finally, to contribute to the decision-making process of member states during the development of policy and financial mechanisms aimed at empowering the creative sector. Resiliat uh, is only one facet of the many initiatives launched by UNESCO. We have also worked to expand uh, access to cultural heritage during this period of confinement we brought uh, some weeks ago together over 130 ministers of culture for a virtual meeting uh, that took place on 22 April. Uh, we launched the weekly culture and COVID-19 impact response tracker and launched a survey with ECOM on the impact of COVID-19 on museum and their professionals. We also some weeks ago published a flagship report on freedom and creativity, defending art, defending diversity, which is available uh, in our website of UNESCO. Today's debate will focus on the recovery of the creative sector during and after the pandemic. As lockdown exit strategies are being implemented around the world, certain cultural activities can resume gradually, while others are postponed indefinitely. The situation, uh, the, the situation calls for a higher level of public support than usual, as well as a review of business models in order to maintain diverse, sustainable and dynamic cultural ecosystems. UNESCO is organizing this Resilia debate in cooperation with two key partners of the organization. The first is the International Federation of Coalition for Cultural Diversity, which is an organization that brings together some 30 organizations representing creators, artists, independent producers, distributors, broadcasters, and publishers in the book, film, television, music, performing arts, and visual arts sectors on all continents. Our second partner with whom UNESCO launched this movement is the International Confederation of Society of Authors and Composers, CISAC. As the world's world leading uh, network of author society, CISAC protects the right and promotes the interest of creators worldwide. With more than 232 members in 120 countries, it represents more than 4 million creators from all geographic areas and all artistic repertories. I would like to thank both partners for positively responding to our urgent invitation to organize the new resilient debate from here, from Paris, but all around the world. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our seven panelists today. Uh, Pascal Rogard has a degree in public law and trained at the Institut d'études politiques de Paris. He founded a theater company, directed several productions, and held from 81 to 2003 various positions within professional bodies, including Secretary General of the Champs Syndicale des Producteurs Exportateurs de Films Français, Secretary General of the Comité des Industries Cinématographiques Cinématographie Audiovisuelles des Communautés Européennes et de l'Europe Extra Communautaire, and General Delegate 
of the so Société Civile des Auteurs, Réalisateurs, Producteurs. In 2004, he was appointed Managing Director of the so Société des Auteurs et Compositeurs Dramatiques. He is also president of the French Coalition for Cultural Diversity and vice president of the European Coalition for Cultural Dis uh, Diversity. Uh, C'est un plaisir de vous avoir ici, Pascal. Voilà, j'ai allumé mon micro. Very well. Ça marche. Mm. Yes, bon. it works. It's a pleasure. Uh, then we have Anita, uh, who is a singer, songwriter and actress. Uh, she's been singing in Portuguese, Spanish and, Eng and English. She's a five-time winner of the Best Brazilian Act on the MTV Europe Music Award and was the first Brazilian artist to win the Best Latin America Act Award. She was listed by Vogue magazine as one of the 100 most influential and creative people in the world and she performed at the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games in Rio de Janeiro in 2016. She's a strong advocate for copyright reform and female empowerment. Anita will uh, join us at three o'clock. She has uh, some uh, some other uh, meetings, so we will uh, ask her to speak a little bit after. Then we have Fern Downey, is the president of the International Federation of Actors, which represents several hundreds of thousands of performers and some nine members organization in more than 60 countries around the world. Fernie has worked an act, as an actress in television, film and radio for over 40 years after training in theatre at Dalhousie University in Canada. She was also the national president of the Alliance of Canadian Cinema, Television and Radio Artists for more than eight years. In addition to her acting performance, she is known for her outstanding leadership and dedicated activism on behalf of performers in the audiovisual industry. Welcome, Fernie. Good morning and welcome from Canada. Then we have Sheikh Umar Sissoko, uh, who is the Secretary General of the Pan-African Federation of Filmmakers and served as Minister of Culture and Minister of National Education from 2002 to 2007. After studying African history and sociology, sociology in Paris, and film at the Ecole Louis Lumière, he became an acclaimed, acclaimed film director. His work, which draws on local tradition, is at the forefront of African cinema. In 1995, his movie Gimba and Tyran was awarded with the prestigious Etalon d'Or de Yenega, the, high, the highest distinction of Pan African Film and Television Festival of Ouagadougou in the Festival FESPACO. Bienvenue, uh, mon cher Sissoko. Then we have Yana Vozarova, graduated from the Faculty of Law of the Comenius uh, University in Bratislava. She has been with LITA, Slovakia's Collective Management Organization, since 2001. Previously, she worked in copyright and international relations and focused on building LITA's information system and online services for communication with authors until she became its director. In her current position, she has successfully reached the dispute settlement with the Slovak Association of Hotels and Restaurants in 2017. She relaunched the dialogue with the Slovak National Gallery initiated the New Year with Slovak Art Project and improved the development of LITA for the benefits of its members. Welcome, Jana. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me to this very interesting panel. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Jana. Then we have Mohamed Saif Al Afkam. is the president of the International Theatre Institute. He has a long history supporting theatre, artists, theatre institutions and monodrama festivals all over the world. He is the founder and director of the Fujiaria International Monodrama Festival, FIMF, in addition to being the president of the International Monodrama Forum. He is the director of the Fujiaria Culture and Media Authority. al Khams efforts, contribution and direct involvement resulted in the establishment of the Diba al Fujiaria Theatre Group and the Diaba al Fujiaria Culture, Art and Theatre Association. Welcome. 
Good uh, evening from the United Arab Emirates, Fujaira, and uh, I'm glad to be with you all. Thank you. And finally, we have Fusia Said, is the Director General of the Pakistan National Council of Arts. She's also a social activist, gender expert trainer, facilitator, development manager, folk culture promoter, television commentator, and author. Saeed is well known in the activist circles of Pakistan's social movement, having worked for decades on women's issues, especially those linked to violence against women, prostitution, women in the entertainment business, women's mobility, and sexual harassment. Welcome, Fuzia. Well, thanks to all. Uh, of you, thanks to all of you for agreeing to take part in this live event with us today. And we will begin the debate by asking a question to each of our panelists. After two rounds of questions, we we'll have time to speak uh, with our audiences. If uh, you would like to ask a question, please remember to use the chat, the chat function. So let's begin with the first round of questions. Pascal, um, it is a pleasure to have you with us today. You are Director General of the SACD, the oldest author society in the world, which represented and defends the right of authors in the performing arts, cinema, and the audiovisual sector. You are also President of the French Coalition for Cultural Diversity. The COVID 19 pandemic has shed light on the important place of culture in our lives at home. It has also strengthened the position of the major international digital platforms broadcasting audiovisual works online. In a market dominated by a, a few very powerful platforms, what measures can be taken to protect cultural diversity as we emerge from this crisis? Vous avez la parole. Merci beaucoup. Alors, merci à l'UNESCO euh, <coughs> d'avoir organisé ce débat et je salue euh, votre, notre directrice générale, Audrey Azoulay, que l'on connaît bien, puisque précédemment, elle était ministre de la Culture et de la Communication et qu'elle était extrêmement appréciée à ce poste. Euh, ce qu'on a constaté euh, pendant cette crise, euh, il faut d'abord dire qu'elle affecte différemment euh, les secteurs. À la SACD, on a la chance d'avoir à la fois le secteur du spectacle vivant, hein, le théâtre, l'opéra, la danse, et euh, les secteurs de la création audiovisuelle, euh, particulièrement la fiction et le cinéma. Et naturellement, la crise est extrêmement forte et violente euh, pour la partie euh, spectacle vivant, puisque euh, tout est à l'arrêt. Les, les projets sont arrêtés, euh, les théâtres sont fermés et euh, rien ne se passe et que nous sommes euh, en train de négocier avec le gouvernement et nous obtenons d'ailleurs euh, certains résultats des mesures d'urgence pour aider les auteurs dont je rappelle qu'ils ne sont pas intermittents du spectacle et donc ils ne bénéficient pas des mesures favorables qui sont prises pour les intermittents. Euh, donc pour le spectacle vivant, c'est l'arrêt total. Pour l'audiovisuel, c'est différent puisque euh, la crise frappe euh, évidemment euh, les télévisions commerciales qui voient leurs euh, recettes de publicité baisser. Euh, le service public, lui, euh, bénéficie euh, des ressources publiques, donc pour le moment, il est, je dirais, stable. Mais par contre, on voit une énorme progression euh, des sociétés euh, de l'Internet, ceux qu'on appelle euh, les GAFA, qui euh, progressent euh, formidablement euh, dans les foyers, puisqu'ils euh, ils, ils sont présents et qu'ils ne sont pas pour le moment affectés par la crise. Ils seront peut-être affectés plus tard par l'arrêt des tournages de films et de fiction, mais pour le moment, on constate une très forte augmentation des abonnements à ces services. Et c'est justement ce que nous demandons, c'est la transposition très rapide dans les différents pays européens des directives qui ont été adoptées pour protéger la création face à l'expansion de ces entreprises. Et pour ce faire, il y a deux directives importantes. Une directive sur le droit d'auteur euh, qui prévoit euh, l'obligation de négocier des accords avec euh, les ayants droit et leurs sociétés de gestion collective au, au moment de la diffusion euh, des œuvres. 
Certains l'ont fait, comme Netflix, euh, certains le font également comme YouTube. Et par contre, on a beaucoup plus de difficultés avec, euh, par exemple, une entreprise comme Amazon, dont le PDG n'est pas connu pour sa pauvreté. Hein, donc euh, celui-là, il a quand même du mal à rémunérer euh, les auteurs. Euh, exactement la même chose avec Facebook qui euh, diffuse des œuvres sans euh, participer à la rémunération euh, des créateurs. Donc euh, nous attendons euh, des gouvernements européens, euh, ça a été annoncé euh, pour la France par le président de la République, la transposition de cette directive sur le droit d'auteur. La deuxième directive importante, c'est la directive sur les médias euh, audiovisuels qui prévoit euh, une obligation en Europe que euh, ces services aient euh, 30% de programmes européens euh, disponibles et accessible au public. C'est la première obligation. Et la deuxième, qui est encore peut-être plus importante, c'est une obligation d'investissement dans la création européenne en fonction dans chaque pays du chiffre d'affaires réalisé dans ce pays. Je sais que les Canadiens sont très attentifs à cette question puisque Netflix est installé dans leur pays et je ne crois pas qu'ils aient une contribution encore très importante. Et euh, cette règle européenne qui a été adoptée est capitale parce qu'elle permet d'éviter euh, le contournement des réglementations nationales qui avaient été faites par les services euh, Internet qui s'installent pour les obligations d'investissement dans la création, mais aussi pour des questions de, de fiscalité dans les pays où euh, les règles leur sont les plus euh, favorables. C'est-à-dire ça rappelle un petit peu euh, ce qui se passait dans la marine marchande quand les gens allaient au Panama, et c'est ce qu'on appelait les pavillons de complaisance. Donc la nouvelle règle qui a été adoptée en Europe permet d'éviter ça, puisque chaque pays pourra soumettre à des obligations d'investissement dans sa création nationale en fonction des chiffres d'affaires qui seront réalisés dans le pays. Et c'est un changement notoire de la réglementation européenne, puisqu'auparavant on appliquait la loi du pays où était installé le diffuseur et donc par définition euh, il s'installait dans les pays euh, qui leur étaient le plus favorable et pas dans les pays qui auraient été euh, le plus favorable à la création. Donc nous, ce que nous attendons maintenant rapidement de l'ensemble des autorités européennes, c'est la mise en œuvre concrète, effective de euh, ces directives européennes qui sont une très bonne chose et qui ont été euh, adoptées euh, il y a un peu plus d'un an. Voilà. Merci. For those who, who don't speak uh, English, so only to resume, Pascal Roga noted that the current crisis has hit the sector of life performance particularly hard. It is also risk widening, uh, widening the gap between creators and distributors. Uh, more and more value is being transferred to large online distribution platforms. He underlined that large digital corporations must come our allies to protect cultural diversity, arguing that internet giants must contribute to the strengthening of local creative and current industries. Finally, he mentioned two successful measurements implemented in Europe that could be replicated around the world. First, the Audiovisual Media Service Directive, according to which distribution platforms must meet a 30% of quota of local content and must reinvent a share of their profits to produce regional content. And the second is the Copyright Directive, which allows creators to obtain proper remuneration for work that are distributed online. Um, uh, merci, Pascal. Uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, we see that with uh, COVID-19, all these issues that were present are stronger needed to discuss. And, and that, that's something that uh, I see that will take place in the next weeks, so months. Yes, I don't hope that months. But we go to Fern, Fernand. Uh, you have spent a large part of career passionately defending the social and economic right of performers. The current health, health issue crisis is having a major impact on audiovisual production, production around the world and affecting the whole creative ecosystem. At a time when the population is consuming more and more audiovisual content than ever before, How can the audiovisual industry adapt to lockdown measures and border closures around the world? Do you fear 
growing inequalities in the industry? Thank you for the question, and it's, I'm delighted to be on this panel. It's quite exciting to be with the people virtually in this room. Yes, there are growing inequalities in our industry, and we're going to have to adapt. People have been watching and enjoying lots of audiovisual content whilst in confinement, and many are now realizing that culture cannot be taken for granted. For example, yesterday's ordinary things like leaving your home and going to the movies or to the live theater has become unthinkable now. So people turn to culture and arts for comfort and appreciate it more because we're humans when it gets harder to get. And we have many streaming platforms, as Pascal was talking about, conveying pre-COVID-19 content. And we have no collective experience available to us right now of the cinemas. So with lockdown measures have brought all professional audiovisual production to a complete standstill. There's except some solitary work with voiceover, dubbing, some commercials, post-production work and script writing, but film and television production is very resource demanding. I mean, hundreds of people above and below the line can easily be mobilized at once to deliver a single shoot. Many productions rely on locations in other countries to deliver the right production design. Some things can be done remotely thanks to digital technology, but most AV productions and especially scripted production is not currently possible. I mean, just like the rest of the economy, AV production cannot thrive, let alone survive through a prolonged lockdown. With cinemas closed and film festivals stopped or virtual, an important window has also disappeared, which will impact funding and box office revenue, which usually sustains more film production. There'll probably be some room left for small budget indie films, but not for larger big budget productions. I mean, even episodic TV shows today have become increasingly expensive to produce, with single episodes competing budget-wise with feature films but we know that lockdowns will ease. The real question is how can AV production cope with social distancing measures and adapt to the new normal with the far reaching safety measures that are unprecedented. New protocols will have to ensure that everyone on set is safe, but I do see opportunity here to improve the health and safety standards on all sets around the world. It's very challenging and the industry is working collaboratively on this right now, conscious of the fact that things must be done properly. So for actors who must interact closely on camera and cannot be wearing personal protective equipment like masks and gloves, it's a very hard nut to crack. Technology and other arrangements like you know, split screen or script adaptations, so there's a lot of solitary shots, will not solve everything. Special arrangements will need to be created to minimize risk, and they will fundamentally impact production and costs. I don't think it's going to get cheaper to produce audiovisual content. Extensive location shooting may simply not be possible anymore. Um, it may be easier for what I would call big producing countries with mature audiovisual industries with established unions to adapt to these new standards. But inequalities will increase, and many countries whose burgeoning industry still heavily relies on international production and co production will suffer greatly. And emerging screen based domestic industries and countries just beginning to make strides. How will they even get out of the door? So freelance workers are those most heavily impacted and also those most likely to find themselves without a safety net. Inequalities in the industry have been starkly highlighted by this recent plight. Gender equality too is likely to be affected with an increased care burden falling on women in the context of the pandemic and increasing competition in relation to re-entry into the labor market. Women in the industry often face difficulties when there is any career interruption 
for example, we've certainly seen it over many decades, returning to work after maternity leave. So it may be that they will face similar hurdles after the current crisis and measures to address this would be very welcome. So the inequalities exist and our power to rapidly change the outcomes, I believe, now also exists. So thank you. Merci. That's great to hear that you think that we have something positive to take uh, of this uh, crisis and uh, and somehow it gives us also the opportunity to reflect about it and, and not only to say that uh, the industry will change and we know we have to adapt, but we have to build this adaptation and not to wait to be uh, only receiving this adaptation. OK, I go uh, to Jana Vozarova. You work for LITA, an organization that has been defending copyright and artists for more than 70 years. During the pandemic, lockdown measures around the world have meant that culture could only be accessed through digital means. What are the implications for artists? How can copyright measures be improved and adapted to ensure, to ensure fair remuneration for creators in the digital environment? That is a question. Uh, thank you. That's a very interesting question. And I think uh, the European Union uh, last year gave a clear answer. It's uh, uh, in the directive uh, on the copyright, uh, copyright in digital sing single market. And uh, I would like to, or maybe uh, we should focus on a correct implementation of Article 17 and 18. Uh, one is uh, one deals with uh, um, um, uh, licensing of uh, online uses of works, and the other one uh, speaks about fair remuneration of authors and performers. And it is very uh, vital that uh, uh, local governments implement these articles correctly and that they safeguard that the authors and performers uh, can live uh, from, their, from their work even if they cannot, uh, uh, for example, have uh, as the visual artists cannot have exhibitions, uh, no auctions are going on now. Uh, for a theater, there is uh, no, no live events, no performances. Uh, cinemas are closed, but still, uh, and the productions, for example, of series in TV is, has stopped. But if there is uh, this system of uh, fair remuneration, which is uh, connected with the real usage of the work, the, the authors still are able to earn from their older works. So like this, for example, in my society, authors who have signed agreements with the TV, which uh, cover uh, the, which uh, have the clauses that they should receive remuneration for each use of the work, they still receive the remuneration, but uh, unfortunately it is a common practice uh, in Slovakia now to buy out the rights, be it from the uh, authors of audiovisual works, dramatic works, visual uh, arts, um, and then the authors don't receive any remuneration after the uh, first uh, publishing or uh, performance of the work. And that's very unfortunate. So uh, we will, uh, as a CMO, we will, uh, we are now co cooperating with the Ministry of Culture and we will uh, try to uh, push and safeguard uh, for the authors and performers this uh, right to uh, fair and unfavorable remuneration. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, je, je me tourne vers Sheikh, Sheikh uh, Umar Sissoko. You are in the unique position of being both a renowned, a renowned artist 
and also a politician. You have been Minister of Culture of Mali. At the virtual meeting of Minister of Culture organized uh, on 22 April here in UNESCO, many ministers called for the establishment of an international support fund for culture, which will help world's less wealthy countries to support their cultural sectors. Many of them also called for a greater cooperation between countries and between regions. Does this cooperation seem possible to you and what form should it take in your view? Is there also a regional effort to be made at the level of the African continent? Vous avez uh, la parole, Monsieur Sissoko. Merci, uh, Ernesto. Ernesto et, et Pascal sont très bien coiffés, très bien rasés. Donc, euh, ils n'ont pas la nostalgie de leur euh, coiffeur comme moi. Et cette question, elle est essentielle. Le besoin de créer euh, un tel fonds est réel. Mais ce n'est pas la première fois qu'on le demande. Ce n'est pas la première fois qu'on le, qu le demande. Si les ministres de la culture de chaque pays ont conscience que la culture est le fondement de l'humanité, ils doivent travailler à ce que la culture est une plus grande considération dans les programmes et les budgets des, des gouvernements, ce qui n'est pas le cas. D'abord, construire euh, euh, une politique culturelle conséquente qui puisse amener donc, à avoir la nécessité, avec les moyens, donc, de doter euh, les artistes, les créateurs, les, les organisations culturelles, les entreprises culturelles, à avancer et à faire ce que le monde aime le mieux, ce sont les créations artistiques et culturelles. Et aujourd'hui, euh, 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 nous sommes dans une totale impasse, euh, c'est vrai, mais euh, les artistes n'ont pas attendu euh, qu'on en vienne à des solutions qui puissent leur permettre donc, de vivre vraiment de leur métier. Je veux vous prendre l'exemple euh, du Mali et l'exemple de l'Afrique. Au Mali, en 2005, euh, s'est créé Segou Art Festival sur le Niger, qui est un festival des arts, de la musique, de l'artisanat et des symposiums pour les contes et autres expressions euh, culturelles euh, des populations du monde. 35 000 personnes y participent, et, du monde entier. Et c'est toute l'Afrique qui y amène euh, euh, leur euh, création artistique et aussi euh, nous faisons toujours une ouverture sur le monde le monde euh, est présent tout cela a été à l'initiative d'un promoteur culturel Mamou Daffé et en 2009 ils ont senti la nécessité de créer une fondation pour pouvoir pérenniser et faire avancer ce travail qui permet aux artistes donc, de montrer leurs œuvres, d'être en contact avec euh, euh, les producteurs, les distributeurs mais aussi aux jeunes de présenter leurs nouvelles œuvres. Mais 2011, ils ont encore compris qu'il faut absolument innover et créer un centre culturel correct qui va travailler à la formation, à l'approfondissement euh, des compétences. Parce que la grande question qui se pose pour nous et qui ne se pose pas aux autres continents, c'est la structuration de l'économie de la culture, la professionnalisation, c'est-à-dire euh, qu'il y ait des entreprises qui puissent vraiment prendre en charge ce énorme étalage de possibilités de créer sur le continent. Et le Centre culturel Corée, sur le plan du numérique, vient d'ouvrir trois portails. Le portail e-learning pour permettre la formation en ligne, le portail e-galerie pour permettre les échanges, qu'on puisse voir les œuvres qui existent et qu'on puisse en discuter. Et le portail e-book pour que les gens puissent avoir accès donc au livre et continuer à s'informer, à se former, à connaître ce qui se passe vraiment dans le monde et ce qui a été écrit autour de cela. Mais cela n'a pas été suffisant après 2011. Il y a eu 2012 où, comme vous devez le savoir, cette tragédie que nous vivons avec la guerre, les terroristes, les rebelles, au nord, au centre et un peu partout aussi dans le pays. Alors, ce groupe, toujours autour de Mamoud Daffé, a vu la nécessité de créer un fonds, le fonds Maya. Le fonds Maya qui participe donc à permettre aux artistes de renforcer leur résilience, donc en leur permettant donc des prêts, des subventions et des aides. 
pour leur permettre donc de continuer à maintenir leur structure, de continuer à maintenir leur créativité et puis de continuer à permettre donc de vivre. Ça, ce sont des aides qui se font et les subventions, c'est vraiment euh, euh, cette nécessité qu'on a, a compris. Et ce sont les artistes qui sont mis ensemble pour que cela puisse être. Et depuis 2012, c'est effectif chaque année. Il y a trois appels autour donc, euh, euh, des subventions, des prêts et, et des aides. Nous sommes au mois de carême au Mali. À chaque mois de carême, euh, le Fonds Maya donne euh, des aides aux artistes qui sont en peine. Mais cette structure, ces structures ont trouvé que ce n'était pas suffisant. Autant le Centre culturel coréen s'ouvre à tous les Africains, parce que euh, le renforcement des capacités, ça concerne toute l'Afrique, et beaucoup d'Africains viennent y développer leurs activités, viennent y développer leurs apprentissages, leur professionnalisme. Mais on a vu la nécessité donc, de créer un fonds euh, euh, africain pour la culture. Africa Cultural Culture Fund. Ce fonds-là est ouvert à tous les artistes du continent depuis 2018. Le premier appel a été fait en 2018, le deuxième appel a été fait en 2019 et le troisième appel est en train de se préparer, c'est demain qu'il va se faire. Et il va se faire autour justement des causes que le Covid a proposé, des conséquences du, euh, du coronavirus sur euh, le monde euh, de la culture. Et euh, 2019, euh, le deuxième appel a vu euh, euh, près de 700 euh, projets, hein, mais c'est 40 qui ont été retenus et à travers le continent. Le conseil d'administration de ce fonds est composé de 9 personnes de toutes les régions du continent. Deux en Afrique du Nord, deux en Afrique euh, occidentale, deux en Afrique euh, de l'Est, euh, et deux en Afrique centrale et un en Afrique euh, australe. Les deux de l'Afrique euh, de, de, de l'Est, il y a un de l'océan Indien. Et à chaque fois qu'il y a un jury, le jury est composé de, de plusieurs personnes. Donc, le troisième fonds qui va être lancé demain, c'est un fonds COVID-19 pour justement aider toutes ces situations catastrophiques que les artistes vivent. Pas de production, pas de distribution, pas de possibilité même donc de créer un groupe, etc. etc. Et ça, c'est une grande innovation. Je voudrais dire tout simplement que ce fonds a été créé sur les initiatives des artistes et sur une donation des artistes. Alors, s'il y a une, un support, un soutien à donner, à mon avis, c'est à ces différents fonds. Le fonds euh, Maya et le fonds euh, 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 africain pour la culture. Merci, merci M. Sico et euh, merci pour, pour, pour partager aussi ces expériences qui sont nées euh, de, du Mali et, et qui aujourd'hui donnent une réponse. Only to, to create in English, the need to create a fund to support creative industries in developing countries is not new, but it is more important than ever. Culture is the foundation of humanity. It must be put higher, higher on the list of priorities of the government. We need strong cultural policies to empower artists and cultural enterprises to thrive. Artists have been finding creative solutions to survive. In Africa, cultural professionals mostly work in the informal economy. The professionalization of artists is a priority. Uh, Monsieur Sissoko also mentioned that there is a need for more financing for, cultural, for culture in Africa, especially after the pandemic. Help funds have been created but need more institutional support but what he's saying is use the instrument that we have created and try to put all the effort in those instruments so thank you very much now i give the floor to monsieur mohamed saif al afghan uh, you uh, you are um, As you know, artists and cultural professionals around the world have found creative ways to stay connected to the public during the crisis, often by using digital means. However, some performing arts like theater and dance are more brilliant, brilliant on people being together in a space and cannot easily be transferred to digital platform. As the president of the International Theater Institute, how do you think theater can adapt to this new reality? The floor is you, Mohamed. Uh, thank you, Mr. 
uh, I'm glad to be here with you uh, today. And uh, I think there is no thinking of uh, trying to adapt to the situation. We have to adapt. We have to be creative enough. I think uh, UNESCO uh, have uh, a lot of creative people, artistic people who always think out of the box. So I think this is the uh, mean time or the main time to, to think out of the box, to be creative enough to reach people. We are not uh, economists, we are not uh, politicians, but we are an artist. We, we, we can bring people together. I, uh, I believe uh, in the ITI, in the International Theatre Institute, uh, we are planning to, uh, to make uh, a conference call, a debate between uh, professional artists and uh, writers to give us new ideas, new solutions. How uh, can we go of, of, uh, of connecting people together? We have tried, uh, unfortunately, uh, the International Theatre Day and the International Dance Day, we had to do it online. And it was a good success. Uh, we uh, had people reading the uh, message of the International Theatre Day uh, from all uh, different countries by different languages and we posted in our website. And I think that was giving the people that we are still connected, we are together. Uh, theater needs audience, but I think in this time, uh, and I hope and we always pray this uh, time will not take uh, long. I mean, hopefully soon we'll get back to our normal life. I think we could use it uh, in, in teaching people online, teaching them, uh, providing them maybe ITI and UNESCO have uh, to bring a new program by providing uh, theater classes, speaking classes, dancing classes, body languages, and teaching people where, uh, wherever they are online. I, I, I am lucky to have a team uh, with uh, Tobias Bianconi, our director in the ITI, and his assistant, and our uh, executive team who are doing their best to make sure that our connectivity is stronger even now than before. I know it's maybe virtual, we are uh, connecting each other uh, via uh, uh, video call, uh, telephone, but I think we have to make people feeling that we are with them. And hopefully we will come with a new, we will come up with new ideas to connect people together and bringing people together. I'm urging writers and singers and white people to, to to be online, to, to sing online, to act online, to be with, with their uh, audience online, and hopefully uh, things will be improved soon. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you, that's very, very important what you say. Uh, I want to know, um, you're informing me that uh, Anita is joining us. Uh, I don't see her yet, but uh, if she's here, Anita, obrigado. No, I don't see her yet, so we will continue. And um, now. Um, Hello. Yes. Hi. You hear me now? We hear you, but we don't see you. Yes, we see oh. you right now. How are yeah. you? Obrigado. Oh. Oh, well, thank you. I'm fine. How are you? Good morning. Nice. Actually, good morning here. I don't know where other people are, but here's good morning. So thank you so much. Thank you to be part of, of this uh, meeting. So if you allow me, we'll get into your question. Uh, you recently participated in a two day internet live streaming charity concert, uh, Music Lives. The concert yeah. benefited the Musician Cares COVID-19 Relief Fund, which was created to provide um, relief to music industry professionals who lost their jobs as a result of the pandemic. What additional, additional measures do you think should be put in place by state NGOs or the private sector to ensure that emerging artists and independent cultural professionals make it through the, this crisis? How can we protect the most vulnerable people in the music, sector, especially in Latin America? Anita. So I think I think that when we uh, the most important thing to say uh, first of all is that most of people in the society, when we talk 
when they listen the world the word artists writers they glamorize so much this profession like they think it's only about rich singers rich writers and cars and all those things that we can see on television uh, like in the music videos for example and maybe they don't know or they forget that they're a very big part of this group uh, that are first still beginning second they work on the background after uh, behind the artist so writers people who work and who, who provide their lives only from the the things that they wrote years ago or i don't know the, the things that are right now playing in the streamings so it's important for the society to understand that this group of people this class of people it's not only about the artists and famous people that they see on television it's way more than this so it's important to think that when we listen this word artists we are talking about a lot of people beginners small uh, groups small uh, be uh, people there are um, selected for, for uh, some part of the entertainment so it's important to think to, to to listen and understand this part. It's not only the glamorized people. Uh, and I think that right now, of course, all the governments should have a part uh, on, the, on the administration only to think about the entertainment, people, industry, the culture side, because right now I think people are understanding the importance of entertainment. People are inside their homes, locked. They are right now, they need right now entertainment and, thing, and things for them to spend time and to make them stay home and keep, the, keep home mentally healthy. So um, it would be very important for the government to stop and think about how can we push these people to keep doing what they do and to don't go through struggles, necessities with financial necessities. And this is this is very important. I think when the government listen the word entertainment, they forget how important this is for the society. And it's important to look at these people and understand how can they monetize what they are doing for the people right now to to enjoy the like we can say because we enjoy their times on quarantine enjoy like not not being so bad as it could be without entertainment without music without arts art so you need that we will come back to you but uh, let me give uh, the, the the floor to Futsia Saeed you are a strong advocate for women's rights in Pakistan. In a report published in early April, the UN recognized that the progress made in gender equality in recent years risk being, uh, risks being reversed at the crisis has devastating economic and social consequences for women. UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez called on governments to put women and girls at the center of their efforts in planning for post-crisis recovery. What measures do you think should be taken to ensure that women can participate in the recovery of cultural and creative industries? Fulia, you have the, the floor. OK, thank you very much. Okay, first, I want to just talk about the context a little bit in terms of culture as well as including women in that. Um, and I want to say that uh, I will talk about the impact of COVID-19 and the Corona crisis, but uh, we need to understand that here uh, the cultural community or the artistic activity has not fully become like a cultural industry yet and the, this area is already vulnerable and the artist community especially the majority of them uh, which are not like famous and rich the majority of them are already kind of a high-risk community and they 
and it is already very difficult for them to make their living. So uh, after saying that, I want to say that the people we're talking about, or at least I'm talking about, are already people who were vulnerable. So therefore, this crisis has hit them very badly. And uh, because we were not equipped to quickly jump on to the internet world and uh, quickly take our things online, uh, because of the remoteness of a lot of artists that live in areas where transportation is a big uh, is, is difficulty, their exposure, their connections. So not many people have smartphones in these communities that are in remote areas. So it was not uh, that uh, we were very ready to uh, quickly make the transition. I must say the very successful examples are there where uh, groups and communities have made that uh, transition very quickly, but it was a difficulty because most of the people who are here in different villages do not have access to internet, do not many times have access to smartphones or computers, uh, and there are language barriers. So, so I'm just saying that the ground was a bit rocky already. Um, I think we have excellent examples of people uh, switching over to online, using online apps, etc. But if I divide uh, the impact, it'll be the initial shock and the need for basically food and uh, daily living. So the government has stepped up. They have given grants and rations and a lot of the organized cultural community uh, they have gotten together and they have raised funds and they have given Russian grants, meaning, you know, the basics, etc. So there have been attempts to do that. Women, of course, suffer a lot because they are the caretakers of the family in terms of providing food, etc. Uh, the second aspect or the second phase were, was adapting uh, quickly to other modes. And this is where I'm saying, for example, at the Pakistan National Council of the Arts, we quickly shifted our concerts uh, to online concerts where we had social spacing and and we paid people to then uh, post it live uh, from their villages, from remote areas, wherever we could get the net connection. Uh, we had short film competitions, etc. Just like other uh, other speakers have also said that the need for entertainment. Uh, really went high and the need for uh, watching television or online things really went high. Uh, that was very important. It was important to then switch our live things to online. Uh, then learning the apps and the programs and the softwares. Uh, I do appreciate the availability because I think that has helped people and somewhere I was listening to an analysis that the whole humanity has been pushed uh, 50 years ahead in a very short time. And I think that is true in terms of our people uh, to be able to use internet and all these software. So that is that is a good aspect, but we are still going through that adaptation. Um, the third phase I would say is realization uh, of the opportunities that this crisis has provided for us. Um, and your initial question was about women, and I would say that many aspects where women are restricted because of their mobility, because of their moving out of town, because of their living alone, because of the family permissions, etc. I think suddenly they have uh, taken a leap forward because when they are connecting online, they are connecting to so many countries. Uh, they're connecting to outside their home to other cities uh, and that has uh, really it has a hidden uh, opportunity for women. I would say the same thing for rural communities because there are many areas in Pakistan which are very rich culturally with performing artists, storytellers, musicians, music makers. Uh, they are so far away in remote areas that travel is a very big constraint and a hurdle. And now if they are trained to use uh, the modern technology, uh, I think they will uh, take a leap forward also and they will uh, escape that this whole um, 
uh, huge, huge impediments of travel, resources, etc. However, there are still challenges that we have not found uh, answers to, even though we are trying to adapt. One thing is that people have switched online, but they have not uh, develop the monetization of entertainment. So fine, if I want to do a concert, I can switch it online. But in Pakistan, uh, we were already struggling with uh, people uh, realizing that they have to pay for entertainment. In, in general, the mindset is that entertainment is free. And uh, the realization that you have to pay the artist and whatever services you are availing, was already low and now with the technological aspect also people are switching to online platforms but monetization is a very big uh, challenge and also copyright is a very big challenge so these are i'm just identifying gaps uh, on one hand we are seeing that uh, this crisis has opened up uh, big opportunities on the other hand, uh, I'm identifying areas. We need training uh, of producing uh, audiovisual materials for online consumption. Uh, we want training in terms of specific equipment using microphones, using uh, uh, smartphones, using cameras, etc. And we do want training of how to monetize and how to include that as part of our online entertainment. Um, I think that the networks that we already have uh, were a lifesaver. Networks of cultural organizations, uh, they have come together very effectively. And I think uh, the networks should take the responsibility of training a lot of our artists that are in remote areas in providing them with, uh, with internet connections or certain technology. I think these are the networks that we need to invest in. So other than providing rationing and a very, very urgent support, I think that we need to build capacity for people to switch over. Um, I am not sure if people realize what the new normal is and we are still in a transition, but I do think that we have to look at both the devastating impact, uh, the, the footprint that this crisis is going to leave on literature, poetry, our creative expression and the leap forward where we realize the opportunity and we stare ourselves to use the opportunity better and reduce the devastating effects. Yes, Futia, we, we hear you very, very clear and uh, and uh, I'm agree uh, with what you said. Uh, I hope that we will not come back to the old normal, but to build something else because we have to learn from this experience. If you allow me, Pascal, uh, je reviens à toi. The vast majority of policies and measures to support the creative sector during the pandemic have been designed to provide urgent financial relief. Few measures address the, the, the underlying structural issue within the cultural and creative industries. In your opinion, what can EU, uh, Union European member states, to do to support the short-term recovery and sustainable activity of the creative sector in the medium and long term. Pascal. Bah, disons que il y a une mesure absolument urgente qui doit être soutenue par l'Union européenne et c'est pas là pour tous les pays d'Europe. C'est des mesures qui permettent d'assurer les tournages de films et d'œuvres audiovisuelles parce que euh, actuellement euh, il y a des risques très importants qui sont pris pour les producteurs puisque le tournage peut être arrêté à tout moment en cas de, de problème sanitaire et euh, il y a des mesures de soutien d'indemnisation éventuelle à prendre pour que les tournages reprennent et c'est vital que les tournages reprennent car c'est toute la chaîne de la création euh, qui est impactée euh, ça va des auteurs aux réalisateurs et ensuite euh, aux diffuseurs. Il est bien sûr important que euh, les salles de cinéma, les théâtres euh, puissent rouvrir, mais ça, ce sont des problèmes qui ne dépendent pas forcément de nous, puisque c'est quand même euh, les blouses blanches, les médecins qui dictent un peu la politique en ce moment. Alors sur le futur euh, de l'Europe, euh, je pense euh, qu'il y a besoin d'un plan euh, d'envergure pour que l'Europe euh, redevienne autonome dans les règles, dans les méthodes de, de diffusion des œuvres. 
ce qu'on a constaté euh, depuis euh, quelques semaines, c'est que euh, la télévision qui est très européenne euh, s'est plutôt bien portée, mais que ceux qui se sont le plus développés, ce sont les entreprises de vidéo à la demande par Internet, qui, euh, pour les entreprises importantes, euh, sont toutes américaines. Donc, euh, il y a une dépendance très forte de la création européenne, et c'est valable aussi euh, un peu en matière de, de musique. Il y a une dépendance très forte à l'égard euh, de ces plateformes. Et donc, il serait important que l'Europe euh, songe à financer, à aider les États qui se regrouperaient pour qu'il euh, y ait une plateforme européenne de diffusion des œuvres, car sinon, euh, il n'y aura pas d'autre choix que de se tourner vers ces plateformes. Et c'est d'autant plus dommage que la création européenne est très forte et que euh, la structure de diffusion qui permet de faire circuler les œuvres, car euh, l'avantage des plateformes, c'est qu'elles ont aussi permis de faire connaître des œuvres dans tous les pays européens et même dans le monde entier, euh, ces plateformes, bien évidemment, elles doivent aussi euh, être européennes et je pense qu'on n'a pas les moyens de lancer euh, 50 plateformes mais que euh, les gouvernants devraient se regrouper et que, euh, comme l'ont fait euh, le président Mitterrand, le président Kohl qui ont lancé Arte, mais à une échelle plus grande, on pourrait euh, créer une plateforme européenne. Donc ça, je pense que c'est une manière de rebondir euh, positive euh, pour l'avenir. Et puis, il est absolument nécessaire, euh, aujourd'hui, là, là, je suis très heureux pour eux, le, le gouvernement français vient d'annoncer un plan de relance du tourisme. Mais imagine-t-on qu'on relance le tourisme sans relancer la création et la culture Je trouve qu'on aurait dû relancer les deux en même temps. Donc il y a un plan de, de relance du tourisme, mais il faut aussi s'assurer que les entreprises culturelles, et beaucoup d'entre elles sont des entreprises indépendantes, très fragiles, puissent passer la période de crise pour que le tissu culturel ne s'effondre pas pendant cette période et que dès que les conditions sanitaires le permettront, on puisse repartir et aller de l'avant. Alors C'est valable pour le spectacle vivant, toutes les entreprises de spectacles vivants, que ce soit celles qui organisent des concerts, des spectacles, que ce soit les, les compagnies indépendantes, que ce soit même euh, le service public du théâtre, tout, tout est à l'arrêt. Et euh, dans le cinéma, euh, beaucoup d'entreprises de production ont vu euh, leurs projets euh, retardés et vont avoir besoin de soutien financier pour passer euh, la période de crise. Le Centre national du cinéma en France, qui est un outil extrêmement précieux pour soutenir la création. Euh, tout le monde pense qu'il va manquer de fonds euh, dans quelques semaines, puisque évidemment il ne perçoit plus euh, la taxe sur les salles de cinéma, puisque celles-ci sont actuellement fermées. Et on estime qu'il faudra à peu près 120 millions d'euros pour relancer euh, la machine de la création cinématographique et audiovisuelle côté euh, Centre National du Cinéma. Donc ce que nous attendons des pouvoirs publics, c'est comme ils viennent de l'annoncer aujourd'hui euh, pour le tourisme, un grand plan euh, de relance euh, de la création cinématographique, audiovisuelle et de la création euh, pour le spectacle vivant. Nous attendons aussi un renforcement euh, des politiques publiques et en particulier pour le service public de l'audiovisuel dans beaucoup de pays européens les services de l'audio public, de l'audiovisuel ont été affaiblis par des ressources qui ont été diminuées et nous pensons que les services publics sont un outil absolument nécessaire pour la relance de la création. D'ailleurs, en France, la fiction audiovisuelle est soutenue d'abord par le service public qui est son premier financeur. Et c'est donc cette relance que nous attendons du gouvernement dans les jours qui viennent, puisque la plupart des, des, des créateurs et des, ceux qui travaillent dans les institutions culturelles ont quand même l'impression que si des mesures d'urgence ont été prises, et elles ont été prises, on ne peut pas dire qu'elles n'ont pas été prises, pour le moment, il y a une réflexion qui n'a pas encore véritablement lancé sur l'étape suivante, c'est-à-dire comment relancer le secteur cinématographique, le secteur audiovisuel, le spectacle vivant, après la crise terrible que l'on vient de vivre. 
Parfait, parfait, c'est très clair. Uh, Pascal mentioned oui. several measures that have been taken to support cultural and creative industries in Europe. These measures mostly offer urgent financial aid to creators and cultural professionals. Pascal said that we need more ambitious long-term solutions to overcome this crisis and relaunch the creative sector in a sustainable manner. He stressed the importance of encouraging mobilizing, mobilizing innovative projects focused on European work and European public services. He suggested creating a European distribution platform as a potential solution. Finally, Pascal said that Europe must develop a global strategy providing material and financial support to cultural and creative industries. This strategy should include protection for small cultural players, strong copyright laws to assure the fair remuneration of creators, and the ability to combine public and private funding, and a strong commitment to public broadcasters. Um, je, I, I will go back to Anita, because I know that she has to leave the, uh, us so, uh, Anita, you recently made headlines for opposing an initiative in Brazil that will have drastically reduced rights for music creators on live events. Are you concerned that in some countries the COVID-19 pandemic may be used as an opportunity to adopt measures that could have a negative impact on the remuneration of creators or artistic freedom? I'm very concerned about this. Uh, actually, I think mostly here in Latin America, I, I have traveled most of the countries here in Latin America, and I can see the corruption is something very big here, all over the countries. The countries have a, a big problem with corruption uh, in the government. So, um, uh, weeks ago, two weeks ago, the government here in Brazil, they tried to use uh, the, the things that could be a, a solution, emergency solutions for resolutions for the COVID, this problem, people who are going through struggles with COVID, some people are taking advantage of this to get into the law, to emergency laws, uh, requiring things that are very bad for the artists. So I'm 27 years old and I know that, that uh, internet here in Brazil has uh, here in Brazil and in the Latin America where this corruption system is uh, the internet has a very big power so right now I'm working on educate the people all the class the is the small writers artists uh, to ask about their rights and I'm very concerned about how this corruption corrupted system can use this moment this emergency Emergency, uh, emergency necessities are the people to try to have to use some tricks to to require things that can take out our rights and how Fuja said that I, I was listening here now people are realizing that entertainment is something paid people need to pay for entertainment entertainment because there are people working for this there are people that are creating the things that are making us uh, enjoy music enjoy art enjoy, enjoy movies series so it's important for the audience and for the government to understand uh, that we understand we know our rights and we cannot we, we need to improve the knowledge of this class, this group of people uh, to see when they are trying to be stole, when their rights are trying to be stole from our law. So things that we fight for years to have like rights. I could, I could fight on a debate on Instagram with one person from the government to take out uh, a possibility of law that would reduce a lot the rights from the artists, the musicians here. And this is also very bad here in Brazil. And they were trying to put it even worse. And uh, I needed to read, to understand, to study with lawyers, with people that are not from my, uh, my knowledge, uh, for me to fight for my people with my visibility, with my followers. So I think it's important for the government to understand that entertainment 
create a lot of jobs. A lot of people depend on entertainment. So it's important. Yes, it's important to pay attention on that. And, and but our people um, very, very armed with knowledge to understand when they are trying to stall us. I think this is very important. Anita, uh, if the other panelists allow me, because I know that you, uh, we have to let you go because you have uh, other commitments. If I can ask you in very shortly, what message, what's me what message would you like to convene to the decision maker to reinforce the resilience of creative sector? Very short. What should be the message? I think, I think that they need to see the emergency emergency measures. Uh, financials, what can be done for the small people? Small people are now suffering even more and uh, each country knows your necessity and knows how it can be done. We need to give voice for the ones who understand their parts. Thank you, Anita, to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bernie. The entry into force of WIPO's Beijing Treaty recently was an important milestone at is, at it is recognized. Um, how um, uh, performance operates and brings them additional income and protection. As we emerge from the current crisis, what next steps must be taken by the public and private sectors to promote and take the status of performers and actors? Who rely on copyright for a dent? decent economic existence? Fernie. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And boy, Anita and I are very aligned on this in terms of knowing of our rights. So the Beijing Treaty brings audiovisual performers at par with audio performers and brings a long, long, long discrimination to an end. So the entry into force on April the 28th, just 2020, is only the beginning, really, because so many big producing countries are yet to formally commit to the treaty, but conversations are ongoing everywhere. So we need to make the Beijing Treaty a truly global minimum standard by increasing the number of contracting parties, obviously. But hopefully the formal entry into force that we have just celebrated will encourage more countries to play ball. So the treaty is, a, is vital because in addition to granting meaningful economic and, and moral protection to performances across borders, it certainly also encourages countries to legislate at a national level to protect their own national audiovisual performers. Because as most of us understand, many countries do not in fact grant any intellectual property protection to their own performers. So in the public sector, let's look. More countries need to ratify a seat. Uh, the treaty allows for flexibility with a scope of protection and countries should always keep the best interest of the treaty's beneficiaries, actors, in mind. And unless we can rely on strong unions, performers are, are very, very vulnerable and subject to biased contractual conditions that can strip away all benefits from their IP rights. So unions have a, a substantial role to play. Countries should in particular pay attention to the transfer of the performer's rights to the producing entity. They need to put in place mechanisms to ensure that through either collective bargaining or the law, performers actually get a share of the income generated by the exploitation of their work, including in the online environment. It is very inappropriate to me that only the you know, the FANG companies, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Networks and, and Google, uh, you know, are billionaires while actors are far from being that. So most of the world enjoys uh, performances on the online environments during lockdown. And still, most performers around the world were barely paid for those online performances. So the best protection performers can get is by negotiating minimum terms and conditions collectively. And to me, that requires a union. However, too many still can't join a union or bargain collectively. Why? Because of their lack of professional status in their country or due to their independent contractor status, which clashes with some orthodox interpretations 
of uh, antitrust regulations. But UNESCO recommendation on the status of the artist sanctions the rights of artists, performers included, to earn a decent living from their professional endeavors. And they acknowledge their, their professional status in granting them access as workers to a fundamental, fundamental labor and social rights is a fundamental step to improve their well-being. The rights enshrined in the Beijing Treaty will be of little practical use to performers if, if they are left to bargain individually for them when they sign their contract. Without a union, i.e. the right to organize and bargain collectively, these rights will mostly be bought out in perpetuity in return for an often symbolic upfront payment or no payment at all, which is the, the most common way in the world. So UNESCO recommendation remains very relevant to us today, despite having been adopted in the 80s, but sadly, few countries have to date given meaningful implementation. So I think UNESCO could consider revisiting it and calling on countries to engage in more thorough contemporary reforms to give artists and performers a proper status and the fundamental rights that we so urgently need. And then just a couple more thoughts in the private sector. A serious commitment to building a sustainable industry solidly anchored on collective bargaining instead of building business models on biased practices that you know might maximize profits and force performers to subsidize production by accepting unfair working conditions in a very competitive environment we need to encourage a sustainable legal framework implementing the unesco recommendation over and beyond their most immediate needs so I think in this time of rapid, accelerated change, we have to make it our time. Thank you, merci. Thank, thank you, Fernie. And, and so that you know, I think that also the the AT recommendation has to be re-read re, re yeah. after this crisis, because yeah. it means more and more for many, many artists that know that they have these rights, and how the politician have to take in consideration that we are not uh, staying at the same level that we were before. So uh, yes, I I really hope that uh, our member states will understand also that we are in another reality and we need to reinforce the instrument that they have ratified or signed or uh, put uh, in place. Thank you, Jana. Uh, the current crisis has affected the creative sector's ability to produce and distribute content across the world. This has exacerbated the pressure faced by independent bookstores and publishers in particular. What future do you see for independent bookstores and publishing houses, especially in Eastern Europe, where production in, in, in local language is already fragile? How can the literary industry survive and reinvent itself? Jana? Yes, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, uh, I think that uh, the the culture which does not sell uh, does not sell itself uh, the the culture which is not so called commercial state subsidy I would say. Uh, so we have to uh, find the value of uh, niche uh, culture of niche niche arts uh, and uh, help also to protect this and to promote this because without uh, uh, small and niche uh, uh, sectors and uh, works and publications we uh, the the um, cultural diversity uh, will uh, diminish, suffer. Yes, we need to uh, support the whole chain, uh, the, the, the bookstores, the publishers, but also the authors. Uh, 
I don't know. Maybe that's it. <laughs> no, no. It's great. It, it's, it's great. Yes, we we agree completely. Uh, Monsieur Sissoko, as Secretary General of the Pan-African Federation of Filmmakers, uh, how? Well, well, you see with the pandemic, that uh, cinema have closed, filming has been stopped, festivals have been cancelled. What do you think the long term impact of this crisis will be for the audiovisual sector in general and for the African film industry in particular? What measure should be uh, adopted at the national uh, or international levels to enable the industry to recover from the pandemic? Pascal Rogard a fait une analyse des urgences, des enjeux et des possibilités que je prends à mon compte, mais en multipliant par je ne sais pas combien les difficultés des, des métiers du cinéma, euh, euh, des, des producteurs, des réalisateurs, euh, des comédiens, mais aussi de tous les artistes, parce que en Europe, il y a des filets sociaux, en Europe, il y a euh, des services publics euh, qui ont du répondant. En Europe, vous avez euh, euh, la SACD donc, euh, qui, qui protège et qui défend euh, les artistes et le monde du cinéma. Et euh, sur le plan international, vous avez la CISAC qui milite vraiment pour euh, les droits d'auteur. C'est pour cela d'ailleurs que nous, nous avions créé avec la CISAC euh, la PASER, l'Alliance pour euh, la défense euh, des, des, des scénaristes et des réalisateurs. Euh, la PASER qui va travailler justement à à faire en sorte que les droits d'auteur soient euh, récupérés. Et si cela est déjà fait, comme l'a dit euh, Pascal Boga, on pourrait faire face donc, euh, à ce drame que, vit en ce moment, euh, que vivent en ce moment euh, euh, les artistes, euh, particulièrement euh, euh, les, les cinéastes, euh, euh, parce que beaucoup sont en train de fermer euh, leurs entreprises culturelles, beaucoup ne travaillent pas. Alors l'urgence, l'urgence, c'est d'abord la situation sociale de ces personnes-là. Et c'est pour cela que, oui, vous avez raison. Sauf quand vous dites avec euh, la dame qui est intervenue que les États ont la balle dans, dans leur camp. Euh, Est-ce que euh, les fonds nationaux qui avaient été créés par quelques rares pays, donc euh, comme le Burkina, le Sénégal, le Mali, le Maroc, les pays de l'Afrique du Nord, vont pouvoir continuer et vont euh, se mettre à aider socialement pour que euh, les gens... Donc, ils puissent mettre le pied à l'étrier parce qu'ils ne peuvent plus travailler, ils ne vivent plus, ils sont dans des situations sociales dramatiques avec, euh, avec les familles. C'est ça qu'il faut faire. Et nous, au niveau de la FEPACI, on avait déjà un contact avec l'Union africaine, puisque nous sommes arrivés à faire créer avec l'Union africaine la Commission africaine pour le cinéma et le domicile, qui devait réfléchir à ce genre de questions. Mais dans la situation actuelle, est-ce que les discussions ont eu lieu Nous avions aussi, avec le président de la Commission de l'Union africaine, donc, euh, euh, engagé donc ce processus de création d'un fonds panafricain pour le cinéma et l'audiovisuel. Et, et lui, il avait plein d'engagement au fait par le dernier de s'y engager. Mais ce qui est sûr, c'est que déjà, au niveau de, euh, du fonds africain pour la culture dont je vous ai parlé, il y a euh, euh, cet appel de demain qui va euh, euh, participer donc, euh, à un fonds de solidarité pour les artistes et les organisations culturelles. Ça, c'est extraordinaire. C'est ça qui va permettre certainement à cet essai au niveau de tout le continent. C'est pour ça que je vous ai dit que le meilleur soutien qu'on pouvait faire, c'était à ce fonds euh, euh, africain de la culture qui est dirigé par euh, un Togolais, Jean-Luc Sonneil. Euh, mais qu'est-ce que nous avons fait d'autre C'est avec euh, l'UNESCO, nous avons un partenariat dynamique avec l'UNESCO pour euh, protéger l'African Film Heritage euh, Project parce que nous resterons les films pour euh, 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 défendre euh, les films qui sont euh, en, en difficulté. La question qui existe tout simplement, c'est qu'il faut que cette politique culturelle qui est absolument nécessaire puisse prendre en compte toutes les difficultés et que les États aient une meilleure considération pour la culture, ce qui n'est pas le cas. Quand j'étais ministre de la Culture, j'avais 0,37% du budget, un budget qui n'était déjà pas assez costaud, et les 80% de ce budget étaient consacrés au fonctionnement et euh, euh, au paiement des, des salaires. Donc je n'avais que 20% pour m'occuper de tout. Heureusement que la coopération internationale, et vous en avez parlé, elle est importante, la coopération internationale existait au niveau sud-sud, au niveau sud-nord, qui a permis, surtout avec l'Union européenne, de mettre en place 
un programme de soutien aux initiatives culturelles qui nous a permis vraiment de sortir la tête de l'eau, sinon c'était vraiment euh, impossible. Voilà ce que je, je peux dire euh, succinctement. Au micro, uh, yes, it was off. Um, yes, yes, yes. The, the project that you are talking, Monsieur Sissoko, uh, with UNESCO, is really important because it's a memory that we are trying to preserve. Uh, Monsieur Mohamed Saif uh, Alaram, uh, you are the founder and director of the Fujarja International Monodrama Festival. Festivals have been particularly affected by the pandemic, often being either cancelled or postponed or moved online. As we emerge from the crisis, what future do you see for festivals around the world? Uh, thank you, Ernesto. Uh, I think uh, festivals will still go on. Uh, today we are in a situation where are the mosques are closed, the churches are closed, everything that has gathering is closed. So I think festival is, uh, is, is uh, part of it. But there is a bright side to it. Uh, in two days, uh, the airplane, some airplane will start to fly over to uh, some destination. Some shopping center has been uh, reopened. I urge people to still uh, be careful and try to arrange uh, smaller scale uh, festivals in their cities, in their town uh, to gather. If we are not able to travel from one country to another, I think we still need to gather among uh, our cities and among our countries. Festivals are to connect people and to exchange between different uh, nationalities, uh, different culture, different uh, uh, school uh, of arts. Uh, if you think, guys, today we are in a better situation than the world after the uh, Second World War. Today we have technology. Today we are still living in peace, and I think by helping each other, by organizing things online, we will be able to uh, to to make this art still alive. Uh, a lot of people ask, uh, is art and culture a priority in this kind of situation? I believe yes. It's one of the top priorities. We have to maintain. Uh, our uh, art, we have to maintain our culture. We have to be more productive in, in bringing people together and presenting uh, online uh, activities. Uh, festivals will come back after people are comfort comfortable again by gathering and being together. I think we'll be able to come back and join each other and uh, enjoy the performance, whether uh, theater or uh, music <coughs> or dancing. I think this will be over soon, but in this time we have to be strong by gathering uh, next to each other, by performing online, by helping people, by looking at the bright side of it, uh, by uh, helping people to save nature, to understand. Maybe we will come up with the new guidelines for humanity and art and culture will be uh, part of it. Thank you. Yes, if, if, if I'm taking you the right words, uh, today we've been reading a lot. Do you remember after the crisis of 29, we had the New Deal and part of the New Deal was cultural. Maybe this new time when I hear you all these voices, Maybe opportunity, and it's a strong word, but to make this new deal uh, for the culture. Because what I hear is that a lot of things will change, but it's important to understand that times that we knew before have to uh, change also, because we cannot continue in this situation. With a new crisis, it will be worse. So we have to get in touch with ourselves and with the community to understand that we need more support to ensure that if we go to our crisis time, we will have the instruments to make as better as we can. Sorry, I didn't translate the uh, what uh, Monsieur Sissoko said before, so I will take very shortly. Um, Monsieur Sissoko said 
in, in France before that uh, there are many organizations that are defending artists and authors in Europe and worldwide, including uh, CISAC, SACD. He mentioned that the more urgent concern right now, especially in Africa, is to protect the status of artists. It is the essential that states intervene to protect the social and economic rights of artists. And in the current situation, um, the best things people can do is to give to the Pan-African Fund that was recently created to support uh, this uh, effort in the continent of Africa. OK, so now we go uh, to the last question before uh, the audiences, and it's uh, directed to Fusia. Said, uh, you have spent the last three decades promoting local culture and creativity in Pakistan, including as head of the Folk Society of Pakistan. Uh, tell us, what is the role do you think education can play in relaunching more resilient cultural and creative industries after this crisis? How can young people in particular participate in this process? Fusia. Okay. Thank you very much. I think that is a very important question to uh, think about. Um, education is is an institution that rebuilds the society. And again, I would say that there were gaps already and and there are opportunities right now. I think that the whole education sector number one can introduce culture not just as uh, an activity that you engage in when you have free time at your leisure, but culture as an industry. I think it's about time that we raise its status to what I would say mere entertainment to a function in the society and a service providing sector which should be given the status of an industry. And if education can introduce culture like that in an institutionalized manner, I think that will be a big help. Uh, secondly, I think that uh, the realization that artistic activity or what we in general call cultural activity is really the soul of a society. And usually whenever you have to cut budgets or you have to cut any activity, this goes really fast. Uh, so considering this to be a core function in the society, what one actually lives for, that only education and grooming can bring about. That realization is very important and that can be brought about through education. That artistic activity is what one lives for. Um, so I think that the general stature of artistic or creative industry needs to be elevated through that. Then there is another dimension where education is very important. That is uh, to have formal schools, uh, professional schools, for example, in film, in music, in theater, uh, several other performing arts and puppetry. Uh, we have a dearth of that. And therefore, uh, the peop uh, people who are into this industry, who go into this industry, are not very professional in terms of demanding uh, remuneration and looking out for their copyrights, etc. Because it you it was a hobby and then it developed into a profession, but they have not gone through schooling. So I think education should um, uh, sort of uh, be responsible in terms of addressing this whole service sector, the cultural uh, creative industry, and set up institutions. And these in institutions should not be conventional. For example, not just teaching theater as theater, but also in this new times using technology, how in, in an innovative manner we can use the creative industry. And that should come through formal institutions. So I think that uh, the government also needs to pay more attention to that, how to formalize this sector, whereby there are institutions we are also considering to set up two major institutions at a national level. One is a film institute and one is a performing arts academy. And I think this is the trend we should um, follow. Provided that these institutions keep the contextual complexities uh, in mind and prepare the professionals not in a conventional way, but to meet the demands of the current times and have the best technological innovations incorporated into the curriculum. 
Um, and I think that at the policy level, at the professional level, and also at the general societal level, uh, this kind of an education will create a new generation of professionals who are not people who can be shoved away or who are fragile, but professionals that are sound in their professional education. They are sound in knowing their rights and they're sound in creating institutions uh, that can be a, a source of long term careers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I'm proposing you some of the questions that we have received. So from uh, uh, Nakateko of Mozambique, uh, there's a question. How can we encourage online participation in a country like Mozambique, where many musicians and artists have limited access to Internet? Comment pouvons-nous encourager la participation en ligne dans un pays comme le Mozambique, où de nombreux musiciens et artistes ont un accès limité à Internet? Who want to answer? Sisoko, do you want to answer? Somebody else? Allez-y. Vous n'avez pas de micro. Vous n'avez pas de micro. Ça ah, ben. Yes. Allez-y. Oui, euh, à mon avis, il faut qu'il y ait tout simplement donc suffisamment d'informations. Ils ont euh, euh, un organisme de euh, l'Union européenne et des ACP euh, à, à, au Mozambique, euh, au CPA, qui est dirigé par euh, un homme euh, qui sait tirer euh, euh, les ficelles et les mettre en contact, par exemple, avec euh, euh, le Fonds euh, euh, africain pour la culture, à les mettre en contact aussi avec euh, 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 l'Institut Corée Film, euh, qui peut parfaitement en tout cas, euh, trouver des solutions pour eux, parce que ici, nous travaillons aussi bien avec le Fonds africain pour la culture à euh, arriver à régler euh, ce, ce, ce genre de problème. Et, et ils, ils ne sont pas les seuls. Ils ne sont pas les seuls. Euh, euh, il faudrait aussi que, et ça, c'est la coopération internationale, des, des organismes comme euh, l'Institut français euh, ou d'autres instituts qui peuvent exister là-bas peuvent vraiment donc leur permettre donc d'avoir euh, un accès plus, euh, plus stable. Il y a euh, en face euh, la grande île du Madagascar, euh, les rencontres euh, euh, du cinéma court euh, qui travaille euh, avec euh, l'Institut français, qui peut parfaitement donc leur trouver euh, des solutions ou avec euh, les, pays, euh, les pays voisins. Parfait. Nous attendons leurs leur écrits à Bamako pour pouvoir leur répondre. Parfait. So, get in touch. Because you you you're gonna get all the answer from the 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 African Fund for Culture. Uh, y a une question qui est qui est générale. There is a question for everybody, mais y a une question particulière pour Pascal. Uh, la la question est la suivante. Uh, la c'est en anglais. Uh, a post crisis reform de de tous les droits d'auteur régime est inévitable. Est-il faisable? Dans la pratique, peut une réforme être aussi effective, adaptée aux besoins des artistes Qu'est-ce que vous en pensez Je ne crois pas qu'il y aura de réforme euh, du droit d'auteur à cause de la crise. Euh, tout simplement parce que, en tout cas en Europe, le droit d'auteur a été réformé euh, récemment. Euh, la directive droit d'auteur a été adoptée après euh, des débats très compliqués et très houleux. Il ne faut pas oublier que la première version de la directive avait été euh, refusée, tout simplement parce que les grandes entreprises euh, d'Internet avaient engagé un lobbying euh, extrêmement puissant, euh, très coûteux, des moyens considérables pour empêcher euh, l'Europe de se doter euh, d'une législation forte permettant aux créateurs, aux artistes de se faire rémunérer normalement. Et finalement, grâce au soutien de plusieurs pays, et la France n'a pas été en reste, elle est intervenue très puissamment pour soutenir la directive, nous avons pu faire adopter ce texte. Maintenant, l'urgence, ce n'est pas d'adopter un texte européen, c'est de transposer ce texte dans l'ensemble des législations nationales et ensuite de passer des accords avec les plateformes 
de manière à ce que les auteurs soient rémunérés. Pour être tout à fait juste, je dois dire que certaines plateformes, en tout cas en ce qui me concerne, la SACD, vous l'avez dit, existe depuis très longtemps et a l'habitude de passer des accords. Certaines plateformes ont passé des accords et ces accords, je les considère comme satisfaisants pour les auteurs que nous représentons. C'est le cas de Netflix, c'est le cas de YouTube. Par contre, d'autres plateformes, et je cite une des pires d'entre elles, Amazon, qui se comporte extrêmement mal, je citerai Apple, je citerai Disney, mais ils viennent de se lancer, n'ont pas encore passé d'accord. Et d'autres nous font des réponses lorsque nous leur parlons, qui sont en quelque sorte rédigées par des robots, des robots qui n'aiment pas le droit d'auteur, c'est le cas de Facebook. Alors Facebook, c'est une entreprise absolument désastreuse qui utilise les œuvres. Si vous allez sur les vidéos Facebook, vous verrez qu'il y a des œuvres de l'esprit. Certaines chaînes d'ailleurs utilisent Facebook pour faire leur promotion et donc utilisent le répertoire des auteurs de la SACD. Et cette entreprise qui engrange des milliards euh, n'est même pas capable de passer des contrats pour rémunérer correctement ceux qui fournissent les œuvres et les programmes. Donc, il y a un scandale absolu de voir la situation de beaucoup d'auteurs, d'artistes et même d'une majorité d'entre eux dans, dans la plupart des pays et de voir ces grandes entreprises qui engrangent des milliards et des milliards de dollars et d'euros et qui refusent pour le moment de respecter le droit d'auteur. Mais je suis confiant, en tout cas pour la France, car nous avons une législation qui va exister car en ce qui nous concerne, nous ferons les procès que nous devons faire et nous les gagnerons. <rire> ah, C'est super de vous entendre, si sûr. It's uh, very, very uh, generous from your part to share with us. You are encouraging uh, op positivism, optimism. Uh, Fernie, do you think collective management provide, provides an effective solution for, for, for performance to get fairly paid? That's a question that is coming. Uh, anonymous. We don't know who. Fernie. I will respond to anonymous. I have a deep belief in collective management organizations as a right and justice, uh, right and just place for performers, audiovisual and audio performers to get royalties and residuals. I hope they grow in strength along with the unions of the world. It would be a better future. <laughs> I love this answer. Uh, Mohamed. Uh, I am wondering about the emerging digital opportunity and how it can work best for arts and culture. What would be the economy, the economy around it? Do you have an opinion? Well, still the economy, I think uh, itself is suffering. We have to find ways of uh, creating uh, a new means of connecting people together. And I think if, if we could use some platform that maybe uh, we make uh, little fees for people to participate. Maybe we could help artists around the world. But uh, I think we are in a time of having to come with new ideas, creative ideas of uh, performing to people and uh, take them uh, away from this uh, sad uh, stories and numbers of Uh, corona virus, uh, uh, virus cases and I think we'll be able to even uh, create a, a fund for this kind of activity if we think together and I think there will be some some big sponsor I'm not talking about air, 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 uh, airlines or hotels company I'm talking about uh, like Facebook like Amazon like what we said before these big companies who are making more money now in this situation by using their digital platform I think they should help by sponsoring some of these activities. That's great. Uh, Jana or, or Futsi, do you want to contribute something about it? This is the last question. I think that uh, there needs to be a variety, a whole range of uh, applications that need to come out. Uh, right now, the focus is on connecting with each other. Uh, and I think there are many applications that have that are being used even by educational institutions, etc. 
but I agree uh, with the other speaker that yes, this these companies need to sponsor this cultural activity now also. But uh, in and we need to move forward beyond just connecting uh, and also forging partnerships, not just within but uh, across countries, forging partnerships into real business of the cultural industry uh, and use technology and the online programs for that. So not just connecting and having uh, all of us together in seminars and stuff, but beyond that so that they, the, the business aspects can also be addressed. Yes, sure. Uh, Jana? Yes, uh, I just wanted to say that I think that uh, collective management organizations are a very good way how the authors and performers uh, can receive uh, small amounts of uh, remuneration, which will then uh, continuously add up to fair earnings for them. So, and, and they will safeguard that they will not be stripped of their incomes, that the users will not use their uh, stronger uh, bargaining uh, position because in when you have a collective uh, a man management organization which collects lots of authors lots of performers you have th the bargaining positions uh, somehow have the same level so i think uh, this is the opportunity to 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 go through collective management organizations thank that's you that's great Okay, and now I would now uh, like to ask our final question to all of our panelists to wrap up our conversation. And very shortly, because we have a little bit of time, but very short. What do you think that can be done to support artists and creative communities as we emerge from this crisis? And as I asked Anita before, what message would you like to convene to decision makers to reinforce the resilience of creative sector, not only during this crisis, but during any future crisis. I give to you the floor. Please take it, take it. Who okay. are to start? Yes. Full Should yes. I start? Okay. Um, I think in terms of policy makers, number one, <coughs> uh, the realization we need to stress the realization that the audiovisual online entertainment was never as important as it was during the times of lockdown. Uh, when nothing else was there, uh, people had internet and they had the audiovisual. So I think that the policy makers need to understand the importance of it, something that retained the sanity of our society. Uh, and therefore they need to invest in it. Uh, they need to ensure uh, the professional standards of it and they need to ensure the innovation that I am sure will come about. So it should not come about by only people struggle themselves and these collective forums, but it needs to be uh, patronized or sponsored or supported, encouraged, facilitated by government platforms. Uh, I think that that needs to be a major, I would say, takeaway uh, from this whole crisis. So that is one. And number two, I think there needs to be more engagement with government institutions and the cultural community platforms, forums, uh, just so that there is a better understanding of the gaps, of the hurdles, of the boulders on the path, and there, there are uh, mutually uh, compromised solutions, uh, or I would say solutions that, that suit the artist community and not just kind of thought about. Uh, so, so in brief, the second point is that there needs to be a better quality communication so that mutually we can resolve our issues. I think these are the two points I would make right now. Fine. Fernie? Yes, I just wanted to say in terms of governments and our public, if you have deepened Uh, we lost you. OK. That, right now. Go, go. No, on la paire. Being you open, are... sorry. Yes, please do it. Oh, I'll tr third time lucky. 
Yes, you deep, this time. Deepen your respect for artists during this health crisis. I want you to act bravely, decisively, and urgently. Artists prove again and again their fundamental value to society. We want to make a living, so let status of the artist live in the laws of your home country. That's my message for today. Thank you. Thank you. Jana, please. Yes, uh, I think this is the right time to uh, really safeguard the levels and in some countries uh, maybe uh, reinforce the levels of uh, copyright protection and that the governments should really uh, maybe uh, pay attention to the whole value chain, not to forget the, the, the smallest uh, playing parts, the, the authors, and the performers, the creators, this is where the culture, this is the source of the culture. Thank you. Great. Mohamed? I think uh, the government should support the artists, especially in this tough time. Uh, first of all, artists should support themselves and not lean completely in the government, because I know a lot of the governments now working on uh, budget cuts, but I think uh, the government should uh, consider supporting and helping uh, the artists and the creative people uh, in their countries, because uh, writers and uh, uh, actors and dancers and musicians are the soul of their countries. And I think uh, we have to support them and we have to keep them alive and we have to give them priority to help the, the, the country uh, survive uh, this uh, Thank you, Mohamed. Uh, Pascal, tu veux dire un dernier mot? Oui, bah, je dirais juste que le confinement a quand même montré quelque chose. C'est un besoin formidable de culture. Il n'y a jamais eu autant de, de connexions, de films regardés. Euh, beaucoup d'entreprises culturelles ont maintenu le lien à leur public, notamment dans le spectacle vivant, en diffusant des captations. Malheureusement, la plupart de ces entreprises ont oublié le respect du droit d'auteur et des droits des artistes. Donc, euh, je fais appel à notre ministre de la Culture, euh, qui a été aussi rapporteur d'une loi euh, contre la piraterie, euh, pour que les, les artistes ont besoin d'aide sociale, naturellement. Mais ils ont surtout besoin, quand leur travail est exploité, d'être rémunérés et d'avoir la rémunération qui, qui correspond à l'exploitation de leurs œuvres. Donc, euh, appliquer les lois, déjà, ça serait bien pour que les artistes puissent vivre. Parfait. Et Monsieur Sissoko Oui. Euh... Euh, euh, je pense qu'il euh, faut favoriser vraiment l'accès des l'accès au numérique, euh, particulièrement pour les artistes. Euh, le cas du Mozambique, euh, on l'a vu et entendu, mais aussi pour la promotion et la diffusion euh, des œuvres euh, artistiques et, et culturelles. Maintenant, euh, l'appel euh, à l'UNESCO pour ce fonds qui va certainement se créer et puis aux au pays euh, africains, c'est de faire en sorte que les rencontres africaines puissent avoir lieu. C'est Dakar, euh, euh, à Dakar, c'est les rencontres de la photographie à Bamako, c'est Ségou Art Festival sur le Niger à Ségou, c'est le Massa, le marché euh, des arts et des spectacles à Abidjan, c'est le, euh, le festival panafricain de la musique euh, euh, à Brazzaville, c'est euh, les journées cinématographiques de Carthage euh, à Tunis, et c'est le festival panafricain du cinéma et de l'audiovisuel qui doit avoir lieu donc, euh, en 2021. Et c'est aussi le festival des euh, films courts euh, dans l'océan Indien. Parfait, parfait. Thank you very much. And for the conclusion, only to, to wrap up a little bit. Thank you all for this rich and through, through provocative discussion over the last two hours. We have discussed the recovery of the car sector after the pandemic. It's become clear that also physical distancing measures are being to ease in parts of the world, there is no going back. We must find ways to adapt to these new challenges that are coming. All of our panelists agreed on one thing. As we emerge from the crisis, we must identify ways to maintain diverse, sustainable and dynamic cultural ecosystem. As Fanny said, 
eloquently, despite all of its negative aspects, the crisis offers an unparalleled opportunity to change and improve things around the world. Anita reminds us that we must listen to all artists and cultural professionals, both, both established and emerging, who are all equal and essential, and essential for part of society. Jana brought attention to the risk the current pandemic has posed on diverse forms of cultural expression. Without small and niche sectors, the cultural diversity will diminish. Fusia said that the current tra transition of cultural consumption to the digital space has been a catalyst for her community to embrace technology. However, she also noted that the digital and linguistic gap meant that many were left out this, of this transition around the world. As countries around the world slowly begin to ease physically distancing measures, we must urgently reflect on the creative sector in its new uh, reality etap, new ways. Pascal Olga shared the concern of his fellow creators. There has not been enough discussion on how to support the arts recovery from this health and cultural crisis. The discussion revealed the shared struggles of creators around the world. Many lack the social and economic protection mechanism to face a crisis of this magnitude. In the long term, it is clear that the focus must be on providing the status of artists. As Fern said, too many artists still can join our union. Without our union, and the right to bargain collectively, the fundamental right of artists will be eroded. Shuma Sissoko remind us that we need to build substantial cultural policies to empower artists, creators and cultural enterprises. This debate is just one step in this process. For those of you listening from our world, I would like to invite you to start your own resilient movement. UNESCO prepared a debate guide and also a social media guide which you can find in our website. I would like to end by repeating the words of one of our panelists, Mohamed uh, Saif al -Afkan. We are still connected. We are still together. Thank you very much to our panelists, to our audiences, to KME, the people uh, that have been working uh, with our two partners, uh, CISAC, bien sûr, et la coalition, and uh, for all the people that are working in the culture sector in UNESCO and in uh, technicians. Thank you very much. Be safe. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, Jana. Thank you. Bye-bye.